Okay. Um, hello, Mr. Abraham. Um, we are right now. We want to we want to introduce you to the Arab world right now. Uh, so, Mr. Abraham, how can you introduce yourself? Doctor uh, Abraham Weisfeld, uh, actually. Doctor I'm Abraham. A, a doctor, a PhD in political science, which is uh, rare, you know, because usually people don't uh, take the trouble to do that kind of work. But I found it necessary to be very precise in my critique of Zionism and do it from a comprehensive you know, if, uh, evaluation of uh, European political philosophy, which was directed by my thesis director, Terry Hench from Switzerland, you know, a maniac anyway. So I, I did a very serious work, you know, which uh, theoretically, you know, takes apart Zionism, but it has, and it can only be done from a Jewish perspective because uh, Zionism is not an ordinary colonial enterprise. It is uh, an ideology which has uh, been infiltrated into the Jewish political culture by way of the Protestant Reformation. And it postulates or presents, you know, that the only solution for what, uh, you know, the Marxists called the Jewish question, as if there were a question in the first place, the only solution is to establish a nation state to achieve, you know, national sovereignty. And this is the only form of independence that is possible. Well, all of that is wrong because that political philosophy is wrong. That political philosophy is called, you know, liberalism or Protestantism. And, you know, national independence of uh, Germany uh, against uh, the Roman Empire is, you know, one thing. But, uh, you know, Hegel was... Uh, just, you know, uh, duplicating the original feudal structure into uh, a modern form, and this is called modernism, reformism. And uh, the Zionists, you know, are a couple hundred years, you know, late, but uh, they adopt the same ideology. And this has been, you know, uh, uh, pushed upon them, you know, uh, as the uh, uh, 1835, you know, was the first uh, book thesis, you know, presented, you know, by a British Protestant, you know, calling for the uh, congregation of uh, the Jewish people in Palestine uh, as a solution to the uh, Jewish problem. Now, the Jewish problem they had at the time was that there was Jewish people around there in England. And, uh, you know, Jewish people were first expelled from England in 1292. And they were allowed back in uh, later on, I think, by Cromwell. But, uh, you know, there's always been, you know, this uh, fundamental cleavage, you know, between uh, Jewish people, even if they're British. And only the, you know, Jewish national bourgeoisie are secure in their, their place there. And uh, they're the ones, you know, who uh, uh, like uh, supported Zionism on the condition that the Jewish people in England, you know, would not be disturbed, that they wouldn't be expelled to go to Palestine, it would just be that all the other Jewish people would be sent to Palestine because they were unwanted because they didn't want, you know, Yiddish speaking uh, Jewish refugees coming into England and becoming an embarrassment for them. Very assimilated, very chauvinistic, you know, class oriented, you know, ideologies. That's what Zionism is. And I hate okay. it. I hate it. And I've, I, you know, I've been raised, you know, to, to uh, you know that Zionism is not a real Jewish identity by my mother because she was a Jewish Bundist, you know, from the Warsaw Ghetto. She was a, she was a, you know, an activist. She was a organizer. She was a, a warrior, you know, with her brother, you know, who was a partisan in the force of Russia. This is where I learned this from. I was never a Zionist who became disillusioned. <laughs> I laugh at them, you know, poor little, you know, Zionists, you know, <laughs> they have to suffer. There's an identity crisis. I was raised as a Bundist anti-Zionist, you know, from the very beginning. As for the Bundes, the Jewish Bundes, can you tell tell, tell us more about the Bundes? The Bund and Jewish legacy? Bund. Yeah, the Jewish Bund was a Jewish anti-Zionist organization founded in 1897. And uh, we were the uh, real Jewish uh, identity you know, of the Eastern European Jewish population, which was, you know, the great bulk of Jewish people. Especially since, you know, we had been... Um, ghettoized by the Tsarist Empire into the Pale of Settlement, you know, whether it's by Yellow Russia right now. And uh, Poland was hospitable to the uh, German uh, Jewish working class who were needed employment without discrimination in Poland. And Poland needed, you know, workers to develop. And they were invited there by a king. 
So for the last 500 years, there's been Jewish Polish people like my parents. Except that when I went to ask the Polish you know, uh, consulate here for recognition of my Polish citizenship, they said that my parents weren't necessarily Polish. Why? Now, they were born in Poland. I proved that they were born in Poland. I have the family register written by hand from his uh, little village. Yalki, just outside Lublin in the south. But, you know, not everybody born in Poland, you know, is necessarily Polish because to be Polish, you have to be like a Christian. See, this is the definition of the nation state that the Zionists have adopted. The same story as what Europe did to the Jewish people. They're, you know, importing, you know, this, you know, ideology from Europe, ideology of colonialism. And they end up, you know, they can't do it by themselves. You know, they're not from... They're not like, you know, French colonialists into Algeria who came, you know, with an army behind them and a police force and all that. They came there, you know, as uh, without a state. They were coming there to build a state. And the state was, you know, built at a conference in Basel in 1897. So, you know, it's just an idea. It's an ideology that they were building. And so how did they get backing for this? Because they became agents for the interested colonial power. They wanted to have a base of operations <clears throat> in the Orient. And this provided the perfect opportunity as the Balfour Declaration made it clear. So they became like mercenaries. They were even supported, you know, and they were, you know, the arms, you know, left by the British military were handed over to the Zionists. And the arms that were held by the Palestinians was confiscated by the British occupation. And the only radio that was allowed, you know, to broadcast in the villages, and you couldn't even have a radio yourself, but only one radio was broadcast from the police headquarters, as I was told by a grandfather in a village near Nablus, was the uh, British radio station, which was broadcasting the BBC in Arabic. Okay, And that is the radio station that is recorded in history as broadcasting that the Palestinians should flee and return after the Zionists were defeated in two weeks. It was the mm -hmm. British who made this. It was a conspiracy by the British against the Palestinians in collaboration with the Zionists. And that's the same story all the way down the line. And the Arab states also, the collaboration with the Arab states. Yes, I did not feel, you know, with, I can say it here freely, you know, and I said this in my book, you know, the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations that was translated into Arabic and published in Jordan. But when, it, when it, I wrote in my book, and they read in the censor who was evaluating the, uh, the manuscript saw that I wrote that the Zionists made a first breakthrough because they had a deal with the King of Jordan, that they would partition Palestine between them, that the Zionists would take Palestine up to uh, the Green Line and that the Jordan would uh, retain Palestine as part of Jordan up to the Green Line as well. And the uh, Green Line became an armistice line. Even though it's not the line you know, the frontier, you know, uh, laid down by the partition plan. Oh, no. Partition plan is only half of the armistice line. And yet Israel claims the partition plan, the Resolution 181, as its legal justification for existence, existence as a sovereign state. Huh, well, if that's what they claim as a legal justification, well, then they should retreat back, you know, to one half of what was 1948 Israel. See, they're so hypocritical, so, so, you know, create, you know, like these lies. And then they understand between themselves that this is a lie, but they all have to repeat it in order to, you know, uh, prevent, you know, any alternative, you know, being considered by anybody else. It's because but, uh, Can I uh, take you to the future a bit? Because I, I feel that Israel as a nation state is in a big problem because the world is, is shifting away from, uh, as you were saying, from nation uh, states. Um, I mean, America is certainly changing as, as a country. Europe is changing. Uh, what's going to happen to Israel? Because it's, they, are in, they, they are in trouble. I, 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 I mean, they, they, they rely today on, on that the neighbors are all stupid and, 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 and totally mm -hmm. useless. But, but, but the, 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 the structure of, of the country is, is not a stable one. Or am I getting it wrong? Well, in the long term, yes, that's perfectly correct. You know, there's a constitutional revolution happening. One example, uh, uh, well, uh, that's a sideline. But uh, Sharif, I, I want to say that there's something even more threatening against Zionism. And that is the Jewish revolution against Zionism. 
we are making an internal revolution against the domination of the Jewish national bourgeoisie and their funding of other Zionist organizations as a state international state apparatus, which is an extension of the Israel state into the Jewish political culture everywhere in the world. And they're trying to control every single Jewish person anywhere in the world. And if you speak out against Israel, you are boycotted like me. So I couldn't get teaching after 1980 ever again, because I worked at the Palestine embassy in Ottawa during the war of 82 to 85. That's where I wrote my first book on Sabra Shatila, which is now a, uh, a documentary, uh, documentary evidence in front deposited at the International Criminal Court. But the Jewish Bund, I have to explain further, this is more than what I've just mentioned uh, in that it was, you know, first Jewish anti-Zionist organization in 1897, you know, right away, you know, it started at the same time in order to oppose Zionism because it, it understood the threat of Zionism for the Jewish people, as well as the Palestinians, who were called the Arabs. Why for the Jewish people? Because Zionism was an ideology that accepted anti-Semitism, did not fight against anti-Semitism, was just trying to find uh, a different, you know, layer of anti-Semites who would sponsor their project so that the Jewish people would leave the country, right, or whether it's Russia, you know, collaborating with the anti-Semites of the Tsarist Empire, so that the Jewish people would leave Russia and go to Palestine. And then Russia wouldn't be burdened, you know, with having so many, you know, socialists running around agitating. Yeah, and actually, there's many evidences right now about a collaboration between between the Nazis and the Zionists. Oh, in Hungary, you know, what did they buy off the Zionists with? Eichmann offered them a train with 1,843 Zionists and their families, a train to Palestine, and in exchange, the Zionists they shut their mouth. They didn't tell the uh, Ukrainian Jewish population of uh, I think 350,000, you know, that they were going to be murdered. So they went off, you know, they didn't resist. The Zionists did nothing to help them. It's pathetic, you know, and uh, the Zionists didn't even support, you know, the escaping Jewish, you know, refugees, you know, to gain entry into any other country but Palestine. So, you know, they didn't support you know, the, the struggle against uh, the prohibition of Jewish refugees coming into the United States, Canada, Cuba, you know, with the, the boatload of Jewish refugees, Mont Louis, you know, they were sent back. And uh, a third of them were killed. But the Jewish Bund, you see, is the real political voice of the Jewish people and not the Zionists, even though we are so small still. Why? Before the Second World War, in the elections in Poland, etc., it was the Jewish Bund that had a plurality. We had more votes than the Zionist parties, more votes than the religious parties. We were the political leadership of the Jewish people because the Jewish people knew that we had to get organized to resist against the rising fascist tide. It started in Spain, Italy, Germany, and was marching across Europe. So we speak for the 6 million who were killed. Most of them, you know, poor Jewish people, like my family, both my parents and mother's families, you know, poor working class, no property, Jewish Bundes, and, um, they were, they were lost. And so the voice, their voices has been lost and now we're rebuilding it. And now we have a, about seven chapters. I'm talking about the Jewish Socialist Bund, the Jewish Revolutionary Bund, not the Jewish Labor Bund in New York City, sitting around, you know, quietly, afraid of the Zionists and never speak out because the Zionists threatened them, you know, with boycotts and their families. I had this big problem. In 1976, you know, we had a family Seder for Passover in springtime. Every spring, you know, we would get together, the whole family, both the petty bourgeois and the working class, you know, uh, families there. And we would never talk about politics, really. You know, we would just, you know, sing songs and stuff. So, but there was one guy who was the only survivor of a Russian-Ukrainian village uh, who went to Palestine because he, he didn't know where else to go. And he became a soldier and he actually was a war criminal. He admitted to me uh, later on, much later on, that he was ordered to kill the Egyptian prisoners of war disarmed. And he did, he was a war criminal. 
And he would come to the satyrs and he would attack me and say, you are a traitor. He'd call me a traitor and start yelling at me. And you know, everybody else you know, was afraid of him, the Zionist. And he kept, and I would answer him, you know, calmly, you know, one year, next year again, the same thing. And then the third year, the middle class, you know, member of my family called up my mother and no, called up the, the host of the family, you know, who was my aunt, and told her that they she didn't she wouldn't come if I was there. Not, you know, the, the, the war criminal. I had to not be there in order to avoid an argument. So, you know, my aunt Toby, who was a slave in a, in a Nazi, you know, war factory during the war, calls up my mother and says that, you know, Helen doesn't want uh, me to be there. So my mother uh, told my father and my mother and father said that they would boycott the family dinner, you know, because I wasn't allowed to be there. And so we had a split in the family between the working class and the middle class. And we never again had a family dinner at Passover. That was the end. I wrote a story about it too. The end of Seder. This is what it was like. This is what it what is like still. But there's been a breakthrough because the president of the Jewish uh, uh, President's Association of, of the United States of America, Mr. Foxman, has now said that he no longer supports Israel unconditionally. He only supports Israel conditionally, uh, depending upon what this uh, current government is going to do. If they move in a fascist, racist uh, direction, then they're going to be attacked by all the establishment, <laughs> Jewish American establishment. And this is part of the Jewish revolution against Zionism that was started by the anti-Zionists. And now even the left liberal Zionists, you know, have to concede that this ideology is not, cannot be supported unconditionally. That this is a political question, it's not a question of identity. It's not an existential issue. It's not a Jewish issue. This is a, a matter of human rights. And so they have to oppose Zionism. It's been a breakthrough. And, uh, you know, various generations of young Jewish Americans have formed one layer upon another of Jewish opposition committees that are activists. It's magnificent, you know, and I'm living it. And uh, I contributed to this Jewish revolutionary momentum as early as 1989. We published a book called The End of Zionism and the Liberation of the Jewish People. And this was published by Clarity Press, uh, an African-American uh, publisher in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, so it's been a long road, you know, I've been, uh, I started, you know, being an anti-Zionist activist in 1968 when I spoke uh, as a Jewish person at the Palestinian demonstration in Toronto. First time that I think there was a Palestinian demonstration in North America. The first time there was a Jewish speaker at a Palestinian demonstration as well. And then I spoke at the founding convention of the Canadian Air Federation and it grew from there. Then I was invited to Tripoli. <laughs> I worked with uh, the Green uh, Jamaria and uh, helped to, uh, I guess, inspire. I spoke at a conference there in 1976, which is on the academia.edu site. And I think this helped to form the, the white book of um, Sharif al-Islam al-Qaddafi, the uh, white book for Israel team, which mm, is uh, sort of a, a melange, uh, a, a mixed, yeah, concept of mixing the two populations, which is what um, I've elaborated more scientifically in the Federation book. Okay, um, about about your book, the Federation, the, the Arab um, Jewish Federation, can you tell us uh, more about it? We, uh, I know that you have been working with uh, Qazafi and uh, you even have met uh, Yasser Arafat. Yes. Uh, okay, but right now we want to ask you about uh, your book. What is the scientific way toward this federation? The Federation of Palestine. the Federation of Palestinian Hebrew Nations. Yeah, is uh, the elaboration of my thesis. You know, the applied, the applied politics, the applied political theory, applied political philosophy, to the 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 actual situation, the context there. So it's. Uh, Recognizing that there is, uh, oh, well, you know, first of all, it's translated into Arabic now and it's circulating in Palestine right now, starting in Nablus. And Nablus is fabulous, you know. So uh, I, uh, this book uh, elaborates, you know, that y y you cannot solve the problem of a nation state with a nation state. 
The problem is fundamental to the nation state itself. So if the Zionist nation state is a problem, you know, having any other nation state isn't necessarily the solution, even if it is a Palestinian nation state, because you still have a demographic uh, actuality of, you know, uh, uh, 6 million Israeli citizens, okay? Mm-hmm. And 2 million of them, 20%, you know, are, are Palestinian. Oh, I understand, Shavik. Bye-bye. So, uh, 2 million uh, of these Israelis are Palestinian. Uh, another 3 million are Arabs, but Jewish. Jewish Arabs, you know, and then the remaining, you know, 3 million is like 2 million Russians, Ukrainians, and 1 million Ashkenazim who control the state, <laughs> who are the original founders of the state. And they are the national bourgeoisie, and they are the, uh, you know, the state functionaries. You know, so this incredible pyramid of oppression, and, and this is, uh, you know, obviously bizarre. And, and it's all supposed to, you know, sort of uh, be, you know, uh, operating, you know, by the, by, uh, on the basis of the equality of, you know, one, one person, one vote. <laughs> Doesn't work. Okay. Um, and you can see that in the crisis, governmental crisis, continuing governmental crisis in Israel. So what you have in actuality in terms of political theory is, you know, various nations in the people sense, not in a state sense, not a nation state, but a people nation. So within Palestine, we have now what? In terms of, you know, a political analysis of uh, the people nations present. The first, you know, is the Palestinian nation, people nation, which uh, exists uh, in, I think it's only about 20% that remain in the Palestine territory itself, mm-hmm. and about 70% who are in the various camps who have, or in or, diaspora. In diaspora, okay. So, but, we talk about the Palestinian nation in its entirety. You know, not just because, you know, there's some people living in the land that they are Palestinian, they're Palestinian by cultural, by, by uh, a people definition of a nation. Same thing goes for the Jewish people. All the Jewish people in the world are, are a people, a nation, a people nation. Now, within Palestine itself, you have, uh, uh, you know, each na- nation uh, requires its own, what in the Jewish Bundes theory is called national cultural autonomy. This means that, you know, you have a, a people that governs itself, that is independent, as it should be, as a nation, not just as an individual, but as a nation. And that you have its own government, its own educational system, its own police, its own uh, uh, synagogues, its own religious institutions. It's fully autonomous. And, each, and that goes in a reciprocal manner as a, as a methodological, you know, uh, a priori, as a condition. Anything that you grant as a right, you know, to one party reciprocally must be granted to the other party. Otherwise, it is not, you know, a, a right. It becomes a privilege. So therefore, you know, the same national cultural autonomy has to be accorded, you know, to every na- nation and nationality. To Palestinian. Palestinian, uh, Palestinian uh, present, Palestinian nation that's present territory uh, with the right of return for the Palestinian refugees. Then the Hebrew nation on the territory. Now the question of the right of return has to be, has there uh, is, uh, can be sort of accommodated as well because a majority of the Jewish people don't even want to go to live in, you know, Palestine anyway, you know, so it's not an issue. Then there's the um, Palestinian Israelis, you know, who form sort of a sub-nationality of the Palestinian nation. Each nation, you know, has its sub-nationalities as well, which require their own internal national cultural autonomy, and each have their own, you know, uh, representation, guaranteed representation. For the whole country, for the whole civil society, then you have a federal council, in which there is, you know, uh, uh, equal representation, and then in order to have a um, uh, a law or uh, practice, you know, or constitution uh, adopted, you have to have a supermajority. That is consensus, uh, you know, seventy five percent for cultural matters and sixty percent, you know, for uh, regular laws, which can be changed, you know, by any succeeding uh, government. And all the delegates to the uh, the federal council are recallable 
by their own uh, uh, governmental apparatus. So this is the, you know, the, the skeleton of, you know, what is being proposed uh, to construct a federation. And a federation is completely different, as you can see, you know, from what, uh, from what a nation state is. But to arrive at a federation, you have to go through various, you know, a transitional process as well, beginning with the recognition of the Palestine state, according to the, uh, uh, the uh, partition resolution. You know, if the partition resolution and Oslo agreement, you know, say there should be a Palestinian state, okay, let's go. And if Israel doesn't want to allow for a Palestine independent, independent state, then the Palestinian uh, uh, state can be supported by UN peacekeeping troops, which we brought in through Jordan and uh, stationed there to uh, stop, you know, the military occupation, stop the settlers from attacking the Palestinians. Then the settlers, the Zionists, you know, colonists there, have to justify any land that they're occupying, you know, with Title D. And if it belongs to somebody else, well, they have to uh, pay rent for the past, you know, period that they've occupied it, and they have to leave and find another place to live. Okay. That's, you know, the scheme of things, you know, like that's proposed in my book. I think it's, you know, a, a good elaboration of what uh, what is an alternative to both the uh, two-state solution, so-called, an alternative also to the one state the one solution. State solution. And so that's why I call it the no state solution. <laughs> okay. Um, as for you, Alan. Um, Alan, do you hear us? I should point out. Yes, I'm about... sorry. I was just looking for the unmute button. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Um... Both of you right now. Um, uh, Mr. Abraham, about the Palestinian, um, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, or about, or for you, Alan, as a representative of Mumfit. Um, both of you are talking about uh, like um, a, a no, uh, no, how to say it? No state solution. <laughs> yeah, a no state solution, but not in. in Mohammed, that... let's discuss this. You know, this is the uh, topic for part two because we only have a few minutes left. You know, on the recording here. So okay. I'm going to start another session, and we will start that session for this particular topics. Okay, shall we do that? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I'll be right back then. Okay.